Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Gallion. Uh, I'm a senior online editor at Digital Film Tree. I'm here with my illustrious co-workers. Right next to me, I have Joseph Suzuki. He is our senior VFX artist. <laughs> our senior colorist, Dan Judy. And another senior online editor partner in crime, Jacob Tillman. And we're here to show you a real world demonstration. Uh, before the break, you saw a bunch of marketing videos and uh, we had the pleasure of cutting, uh, doing <laughs> visual effects and color in DaVinci Resolve. And so what I'd like to do is we're gonna show you uh, a soup to nuts workflow. Real quick, I want to point out what we have going on on the table. Uh, the, the best feature in DaVinci Resolve that we use as a facility is collaboration. Uh, it allows us to collaborate not only for editorial, but also uh, with color. And what we're really excited about in DaVinci Resolve 15 is the inclusion of Fusion. For, so hopefully we can get all of our VFX department inside of DaVinci Resolve. Yeah. <laughs> so what we have is, uh, we have two MacBook Pros up here, and uh, we have the eGPUs, and uh, we have a single Ethernet cable going in between both of them. We have an ad hoc network, so we have no routers, no switchers, no anything, and we have a database that's running on the system right here, uh, that's up on screen, and uh, the second, laptop is connecting to that database. We use the default uh, uh, Postgres database that uh, there's an installer that comes with DaVinci Resolve and uh, setting it up was relatively uh, a breeze. <laughs> so uh, if you're new to DaVinci Resolve, and I'm gonna assume uh, everybody is, uh, if you're new to DaVinci Resolve, the first thing you'll see when you launch the application is this home screen. And what the home screen lets you do is you can decide what databases you want to connect with uh, and what projects you want to work in. By default, uh, Resolve doesn't work inside of a DRP file. So you know, the DRP file you can use to transport your project from one computer to another. Uh, but when you're running the actual project, you need to first import it into the database. And so I have two projects here. Uh, what I want to look at right now is editorial sync. Uh, and show you the first step in any workflow, which is syncing and making dailies. Uh, so let me get started here. Uh, what, I've or what I already have, have pre-baked uh, is I have a folder structure created with my ProRes dailies media, and I have that all pre-rendered, just so nobody has to wait through that process. But let me show you really quickly how I made that. So I have my camera masters, and I'm just going to quickly, let's make a new folder in here. Camera masters. And what I'm going to do, uh, the, this is all ProRes HQ files. And the production team didn't supply a lot with this material. But I want to get it into a range that's more usable for uh, editing. And you can see very quickly, you can drag and drop from Finder. And let's take a look in here. One of these files, or a couple of these files, has a X-ray color checker. Let's start with this one right here. They were pleasant enough to create these little uh, demo slugs with the X-ray color checker. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new timeline. And instead of doing any editorial work at this point, because I want to make proxies, I'm going to jump straight into the color page. And what I'm looking for is some sort of LUT that I can create for this footage. Uh, to bring it into a more Rec. 709 look so that we get an idea in editorial. I'm going to jump into our color match tool. I happen to know this is the classic x right checker. And I'm going to bring up our color chart tool. And Resolve will create this little target for us to source each color on here. And what we're going to do is we'll use that to build an accurate LUT for our dailies. So I'll do that. And I know our source gamma is Canon log. And very quickly, we have a LUT that is uh, 
reasonable to look at. It might not be final color, but it'll definitely work for editorial. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, to export this LUT, if we wanted to give this back to production to use on set, uh, all you have to do is highlight your clip, right click, and let me see if I can zoom in here. We have this uh, generate 3D cube LUT option, uh, which is what I used to pre-bake all the footage with some color on it. Uh, like I said, our original camera masters are ProRes HQ, and our dailies for this, we made ProRes LT dailies. Uh, real quick, I'm going to throw this into collaboration, and to do that, I'm just going to hit File, Enable Collaboration. This option will be grayed out if you don't, if you're not on a Postgres database. Uh, so be aware of that. That is a feature of the full Studio version. Uh, and so, each one of us here, we're going to go through a, a page in DaVinci Resolve and show you the cool tools that we all like. Uh, about it. If you're completely new to DaVinci Resolve, the workflow is laid out with these tabs. Starting from media, where you will be ingesting your footage, uh, edit for all of your offline and online editorial, the inclusion of Fusion for VFX, Fairlight for sound, and of course the color page, all finishing up with delivery. Uh, the more you use DaVinci Resolve, the more you'll jump in and out of these tabs uh, very interchangeably. Oh, look, we have a little activity already going on. Uh, it looks like Jacob's logged into the project already, and what I can see is a little refresh icon, so I can see where he is. And you can see, oh, he's jumping around a lot. Um, what? <laughs> I'm impatient here. <laughs> and in collaboration, it works like you'd expect uh, Avid bin locking to work. So wherever his icon is, I can't go into this project and make any meaningful changes. It will lock me out of it. Uh, but once he has made a change, I can refresh that, and then any media he imports or anything that he changes will be available to me. Uh, so he's ready to go. I better, I better hurry up and, and sync some dailies for him. Uh, I'm going to change the view really quick. Uh, when, in working with this project, what we found the best use case is to create separate bins for each editor. Uh, as well as separate timelines. If we're using multiple scenes, uh, each editor can work on a scene, and then we can all uh, join that timeline in one master timeline uh, at the end of the project. So let me see what we have. We have some, let's see, I believe, okay, so this is all B-roll. I'm gonna throw this into the synced folder for now, and that way Jake can take it and uh, do what he wants with that. Uh, what else do we have? We have some footage here. I believe this is all interview footage. Let's take a look. Some people really like using the thumbnail scroll. I like it initially, but once I've got a good idea on what's in my bin, I always pop back into my list view. Uh, and if, again, I'm assuming you're new to DaVinci Resolve, if you're new to this user interface, uh, the media page is really good for syncing and ingesting your footage. In the upper left corner, we have a file browser, but of course you can drag and drop from Finder or Explorer. Uh, in the middle here, we have a video viewer, which we'll be using to actually view the video. We have audio monitoring on the right. And then uh, there was a question earlier about metadata. You have a metadata editor here. Uh, let me pull that back up. And this metadata editor, I find to be immensely handy if you're adding keywords or tags. Uh, you can create parameters to search media uh, very quickly and efficiently that way. So to start with auto-syncing, there is a small gotcha to be aware of. Uh, when you're auto-syncing clips, you might be used to creating subclips uh, or some sort of compound clip. When you're syncing in Resolve, Resolve will actually see the master file as though it had that audio embedded in it already. So the easy way to tell if your clip has synced with something is to have the scene and take column. Traditionally, that column is populated with metadata from your uh, sound recordist. So what I have here is I have my A camera and I have the audio uh, just in that same bin. And I'm gonna right click that and we have a couple options here. We can auto-sync these clips based on timecode uh, and waveform. If we wanted to keep the original camera audio, we can use the append tracks. In this case, we do not. We'll just use based on timecode. 
I'll zoom out. We can see that some of these clips now have seen and take information. And so that means that they're in sync with audio. I'll pull up the audio viewer and we can see exactly what audio file is connected to this clip. <laughs> and if we right click on the file, we can go under clip attributes and we can see under audio that we have different audio tracks linked from our source uh, master audio. Um, so let's go ahead and check this. As I hit play, let's go back to the beginning. As I hit play, you'll notice two things. The, the viewer for audio is playing simultaneously with the video. And what that, how this relationship works is at any point you can choose to unlink this audio, move it to another location, and link it up again. Once it's linked up again, I don't know if you caught that, the scene and take column information disappeared and then came back up. That's a really good indicator that your clip is in sync. Uh, we'll go ahead and check that the time code is good. I think all the time code is good for this, this material, let's see. Okay, well that's great. Uh, that looks like that's in sync. There's also options, if you take a look at the audio here, you can slip, well, you could slip by frames. Make sure my keyboard is set up. Uh, you, you actually can slip clips while it's locked. Uh, for some reason, it's not operating right now, but you can slip clips uh, one frame at a time. You can, of course, always unlink this, find another point to sync up your clip, and then link it manually that way. Uh, one thing I'll do to get this back in sync, because I unlinked this, is I will punch in the time code of the slate, which will get me back in sync, and we'll link that up. Uh, one also nifty thing to do in Resolve is it can use the metadata that is embedded in the file uh, in a variety of ways. And the, e the, the most interesting way is you can use variables to name your clips. So an AE's job might be to name everything scene one, take two, which is really boring when you're going through a full day's worth of material. In Resolve, if you go under clip attributes, we can change the clip name by variables. And so I'm going to use the percent sign to call up our variables. And I'm going to call this scene dash, let's do percent take. And let's see, this is all a camera. Let's do a, let's do a percent. And I believe there is a cam ID. Cam number should have metadata for that. Let's see. Looks like everything worked except for cam number which I can fix by going into our metadata editor. And I have all of these clips selected. I'm gonna go down here, where are we? The, I'm sure I'm looking right at it, there we are. And I will call this a camera, we'll hit save, and that will update our clip names. And so it's really easy to get the dailies process underway. You can start by syncing really quickly. You can have variables naming clips for you. So really all you're doing is checking sync and That's adding keywords. Sleeping. Sleep. All right. Uh, traditionally, I would go through each of these clips and anything that didn't sync up, uh, that didn't have a scene and take name, I would check to see if it's relevant B-roll. In this case, this is a just a a color checker clip. So my trick to this is just to make dashes for the scene and take name. Once we're done with that, the scene and you can sort by scene and take, and any clips that aren't relevant to my edit will just come up to the top. Uh, let's see, it looks like Jacob is doing quite a bit. Let me refresh what's going on. Oh my gosh, okay, okay. So uh, let me, let's, I'm gonna work on auto-syncing some of these. I'll, I'll quickly grab this audio in, into the B camera and we'll just auto sync this really dirty. We'll, we'll get it connected. And any of these clips that don't sync with anything, I'm gonna hold on to and we'll, we'll kind of suss out what those issues are. Uh, for everything else though, I wanna turn that over to him. So I'm gonna move all of those clips into my synced bin, which he can grab. And I'm gonna keep my audio because I'm gonna take a look at these clips over here. 
and it looks like I'm gonna also try and sync up this audio for you really quickly. Uh, at this point, you can have editors working simultaneously. Uh, I believe due to some audio constraints, I'm actually gonna switch seats with you. Yep. And uh, uh, you can continue working over here, and then uh, I will finish auto-syncing on that system. Sounds good. All right. I just wanted to quickly say, uh, it's about, a, about 10 years since I've been to one of these meetings, and believe it or not, it was right uh, when I came to one of these meetings, fresh out of film school, and I'll never forget, I was thinking, man, these guys are just, just so smart, you know? And I come in here and I go, they're still really smart. I saw we're around really good people tonight, and um, it kind of inspired me through one of these meetings to reach out to Brahmi and uh, just kind of meet him on the side of the street and say hello. And, uh, you know, uh, three months later, I got a job there. So I've been working there ever since, so uh, we appreciate you guys. All right, so Thomas was so diligent and appreciate his work here. Um, at the bottom here, if I just hit my little refresh button, uh, you can see some of the bins. So, so Thomas, while he was going at it and sinking everything, I went and bear trap, by the way, that's, uh, that's a foosball name we came up with. So uh, apparently I don't let any, uh, any balls in the goal. So um, anyway, so here we go. Uh, what I've done is I've quickly just started to look at some of the B-roll. Um, I've started to isolate some things here in the dailies, and I pulled over the selects. And how I did that was I just went into um, different folders here. We've got our sync folders. Uh, we've got our detail view thumbnails uh, for the old guys. We've got our slider here. Um, so I, why do you think I put my glasses on? In here, you'll see all of these clips here for the interview. And what I've done is I just picked up a couple of selects here, and what I did was simply go to the detail view after I found them, or you can just right click on maybe a piece of media here that we like. We like this uh, American Housewife yeah, sound. So you can label them with a nice clip color here. So I did orange, and then I go to the detail view, and it's just a real easy way to sort to find that stuff. So I labeled a few for you. I just isolate that column I want to select. Um, and then if you just click it, it will sort it. I go to the top there. And then all I did was just pull those selects that I happened, I think, to work for this piece on over here. And I just uh, alt grabbed them and, and pulled them over. So if you get on to the selects, there you are. Very good. So that's how, that's what got, oh, look at that. Thomas is in there modifying. He's so sneaky. I'm sneaky. You have new auto sync clips too, by the way. Very good. Very good. So, looks like he's auto sync some stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go ahead and, and start prepping some um, clips for multi sync. So, I've got an interview here of Patrick, and we use him because um, he, re he refused to come out tonight. So, <laughs> we've got to put him on the spot. So, what I'll do here is I'll just go ahead and, and grab these, and again, alt-clicking, pull them over. And so that was everything from our B camera. So I'll go back to the A cam, and I'll find the medium angles of him, and I'll pull those over. OK, so we've got this stuff that I want to see. So if you look here, and I've just to speed this up, I did uh, already do a couple of these here for the Andy interview. So what I'm going to do is I want to sync these two clips uh, based on source time code in this case. So what I'll do is I'll just sort by the, the source time code or start time code here. And you'll see that there's a relationship uh, time code wise between the two. So between the A and B camera. So I'll just shift click, uh, create new multicam clip using selected clips. All right, and I'll just, I'll, I'll type something a little bit easier for me to, or to my liking here. Okay. And we'll sort by time code. You can do by in, out point, time code, sound. It will actually um, check out the waveform and adjust accordingly, or a marker. Uh, what I like to do, uh, a neat little thing here, is the move source clips to original clip spin. Well, just easily after you're done multi, uh, clipping here, we'll throw it in that originals folder to kind of keep it nice and tidy. Here. All right. 
So we're looking good. And I did that mistake on purpose so you guys could see you can modify it after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll quickly just kind of go through here. Uh, did you see these clips? Um, make sure everyone's oh God. getting there were, there were bats would swoop down, bugs. I mean, I would come out of there. I always had a good relationship with Black Magic. And Look at that hat. Look at that plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> Do that basically what I will right after we Okay. We're looking good so far. <laughs> okay. So now that we're looking good here, uh, I'm just gonna go to the edit tab and we'll go ahead and start cutting this thing away here. So I'll start by just quickly creating a new timeline. And we'll call this Bear trap. trap. <laughs> okay, so now that we've gone through that, I'll just go ahead and grab my interviews. Uh, so here I, I've got my first multi clip. Um, actually, let me see. Here. Oh, I should have something here. Okay, so if I pull this clip. When Ronnie first brought up the idea of doing remote color sessions, my first thought was, well, that's great, but I, I'd only heard of remote color sessions being done when production was in South Africa or Vancouver, and, and, and the, the post house was here in L.A. Okay, so that's a nice little bite. So I will just simply, you can do this a, a magnitude of ways. You can just pull it across over right. You can pull it down here, um, and obviously it's very intuitive. So... Um, something that will help everyone out here too, I know you're probably looking for it, uh, is one thing you can, look how just snappy that is, it just does pretty much anything you want. I love that about uh, the interface. And then in addition, you've got your timeline view options, uh, so you can just simply scale up your video easily, uh, and this is more of a, uh, like a, uh, frame view, and then you got your thumbnail view, and I like to use this one a lot just to kind of keep my my timelines nice and tidy here. So uh, obviously, as editors, what we're looking for is a nice, nice, healthy sized waveform, so you could uh, pull it out there. Um, another feature that I really like are the stack timelines. So as you see here, you get this little plus signal, so you can easily just create a new timeline. You can do a new cut in here. Yeah. And let's say I have a nut, you know, like a, a fight here. A with Patrick. That I just want to kind of cut in here real quickly. No discrepancy. Maybe do a string out, me. something. Just a quick little edit okay. here. You can just easily highlight it, um, copy, and you can you can just paste it right in here. So it's a handy little feature, um, and we use that a lot too when we're doing like the finishing work and we have an, uh, like an outstanding shot for a visual effect or something, we're sending things, round tripping things um, from the editors and Avid. We'll just send an AF, copy it, stack it up, paste it in, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really handy. Um, so here we are. So this guy is your snapping, which is in. Um, now. Well, that's great, but I, I'd only heard of remote color sessions being done when production was in South Africa or Vancouver, and, and, and the, the post house was here in L.A. So when there's the dead silence. We're always trying to cut around that stuff. And for the marketing viewers in particular, you know, you're always trying to, to cover it up with B-roll, right? So um, a couple tools that I use here. You can go through and simply blade cut by, by Apple B. And you can do the same thing there. You can highlight the area. You can delete it. Um, and then let's just say I'm going to play the video section. Done when production was in South Africa. Done when production was in South Africa. Okay, that sounds that sounds pretty good. But let's just say you're trying to get the timing a little bit better. So uh, you can just easily by hitting T go into trim mode, um, and you can either do it a multitude of ways, which I like to just pull it out there. You see the waveform going. Very easy to do. Uh, you can also, if you go down a little bit further, you can see the cursor move into more of a slide. Uh, and then I, my personal favorite is actually if 
you just hit T and, and you can hold the command key, you can move you know, several edits at once, which is obviously very handy. Um, so now I've got that, I'll just go ahead and show you. Well, that's bit. great, but I, I'd only heard of remote closed sessions being South Africa or Vancouver. and, and, and the So I've got my cup there. So a couple different things you can do. You can. Well, that's great, but I, I'd only heard of remote closed sessions being South Africa. Most of the time, I prefer to, to, to jump in, start with a wide punch in. You know, that's, that's not always, but in, in this case, that's, that's how I want to start. So let's, let's go. You can actually switch multicam angle right here. So that's an easy that, way. That's great, but I, I've only heard room. Well, let's say you want to do it on the fly. There's a multicam mode right here. You just have to throw it in multicam mode. And then all you have to do is just hit. Well, that's great, but I, I've only heard remote closed sessions being South Africa. And there's, your, there's your I've only heard remote closed sessions being South Africa or Vancouver. And okay. So, and, and we can do that to the, our heart's the content. Post house was, uh, the post house was, and the, the, po the, the post house was here in L.A. Hoover and, and, and the, the post house was here now. So just like that, it's that easy just to get a couple of the multicam edits done. Uh, and then for B-roll, I've got a couple of here. I got Rami because he needed his cameo here. Uh, just find some stuff here with nice little energy maybe for the housewife. And as you'll notice, I also, so targeting tracks, uh, you hold the Alt key and you just simply uh, highlight, toggle the track there to make sure you're on the right, correct video track. And again, you can do it a multitude of ways, right? You can overwrite. And right here, you'll see there's a video clip and an audio uh, clip there. So if you pull it along, you'll see the audio comes right with it, but if you'd like to isolate just one, then you can just pull it accordingly. So in this case, we don't need any audio, so I find my punch point. I only heard of remote closed sessions being South Africa. We're in South Africa. So I'll pull it across there. Get it down. Again, let's look at our thumbnails. Maybe we want to see something of him walking. Again, just, you can either just drag it in or, or cut it in, just depending on where you're at there. And then, um, let's add an audio track here. So, again, I could add an audio track and, and cut uh, maybe a piece of music in here. Or, I'll try not to blow us out here. Okay, so we've got our audio bed here, and I'll just lay it right down here. You can either pull it, it seems to be pretty easy. This is a stereo track here, so we just, as you see here, change track type two. You can do mono, stereo, five one, uh, seven one, and adaptive here. So um, for this, for our purposes, we're just gonna leave it in stereo. And again, I like to pull it down here, so I showed you how you could move the audio here, but you can also do it a multitude of ways, right? So, I wanted to show you just how quick and easy it is here to adjust the levels. Use a little more punch. Okay, and then just, if you hold down the Alt button here, we can quickly and easily just make keyframes. So you can select them. Uh, you can select multiple by holding the shift key. 
That a little bit more I've only heard a remote closed sessions being South Africa. So as you can see, it's pretty easy to get your key frame in um, as far as sound and everything goes like that. Um, so typically after you know we've done all of our creative edits here, uh, we'll prep the sequence, you know, lock your tracks, um, which you can easily do just by a click of a button. Um, and then I can just Hand it out over to Thomas. Uh, I'll export a reference movie. Um, you want to make sure that that your uh, your picture is is 100% on. So Thomas is going to show us the onlining process of this. So after the offline editorial is done, uh, now comes the, uh, the online fun part, uh, where you're trying to basically do the inverse of dailies and uh, relink your timeline to the source masters. Now, for this project, uh, we did a little bit of a cheat because I know what the dailies are, I know what the source camera is, and in creating the dailies, I created a folder structure that matched exactly uh, what the camera masters were. So the dailies and the camera masters match. Uh, so I can do a very quick and simple relink process here. Uh, but let me also show you, so for prepping for online, what Jacob was mentioning is uh, traditionally, when we do an online, we want our locked offline cut, and then we want an offline reference. And what that offline reference is going to be is our Bible to make sure that everything remains frame accurate. Uh, because even, even the best translations between the same software can yield some oddities. And as long as it looked good in the offline reference, that's what we're trying to match. So let me show you our cheat that we did here. Uh, the first thing I need to do is, let me just start by unlinking our audio. So I'm gonna unlink all of our audio. Uh, and at this stage, we actually don't need to flatten, if you're doing this cheat, you don't need to flatten uh, your multicam edits. Uh, all we need to do is to take our ProRes LT media and relink to our ProRes HQ media. And that's actually a good option to show you smart bins. So we have media in our bin structure here, and let's say this is the first time I'm opening up the project. I have no idea where everything's located, much less the ability to relink all of that. Uh, but I can create a smart bin, which is like a small search that we can keep our, basically it'll sift through all of our bins to find the relevant media. Uh, you can use this with file names, video codecs, and essentially any metadata that's embedded in your file. So I'm gonna make a smart bin. I'm gonna call this ProRes LT, because that's what our media is. And I'm gonna look for the video codec. I always do that. I hit enter and it thinks I'm done, but I am not. I'm looking for a video codec that contains ProRes LT. Let's back it up, let's do LT. And let me widen this UI out so we can take a look at all of, this is all of our dailies material that we want to relink. Now all I have to do is select everything, and what it's actually doing is selecting everything in the bin structure. So I don't have to change the bin structure. All I have to do is right click and say relink, and I'm gonna look for where our camera masters are, which in our layout is here. It'll take a moment to chew through everything, and fingers crossed it should say that everything relinked properly. And it looks like it did. It didn't show up at anything that it needed to search out. If there is an issue, uh, Resolve only goes so many layers deep into your folder structure to relink your clips. Uh, if it misses some clips, it will ask you if it wants to do a deep search, which will then look through the entirety of your folder structure. That, that yeah, now we're all online. So you can see right now the, 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 the dailies let is gone, we're now flat, and we're online. So in this case, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. In the, for this cheat to work, you need the same file extension. So it won't do a relink like, uh, like Premiere can do a relink with the same file name across file extensions. Uh, everything that I've done in my testing, you need to keep the same file extension. So for these particular videos, the ProRes HQ, ProRes LT workflow works best. Uh, but you know what, let me, let me go back and I'll show you what it looks like if it's something where you're changing the file extension. And 
And just to be certain, let's double check. It looks like everything has a LUT on it. Let's go ahead and find that in the media pool and confirm that this is in fact our ProRes LT dailies. Excellent. Okay, so if we're gonna be doing this workflow uh, with different file extensions or uh, different raster, or let's just say that the uh, organization of your camera masters doesn't match your dailies, uh, I would still go through the same process or a very similar process where I would select everything. And it looks like this, this timeline has already been unlinked. Uh, and then this would be more of a traditional workflow where you're gonna need to flatten your multicam edits, uh, which it looks like everything's already flattened here. How flattened multicam edits work is if you're using multicam edits, you would select your entire timeline, go under clip, and there, is a, there will be a flattened multicam option if there were multicam edits in this timeline. Um, and then from there, what we need to do is I would, again, sift out what our dailies are. So I'm going to add a smart bin, and we're going to look for our ProRes LT dailies. And because I know I'm going to be create or I'm going to pull in new camera masters, I'm actually just going to blow away all these dailies. Now, word of caution, because if you are paying attention to the dailies process, you know that the audio is linked to the camera master files at this point. So before this step, I, part of the unlinked process, we are already, we have a separate audio conform already created so that our video is now separate from our audio. So just be aware of that if you're doing this uh, afterward. So I'm gonna delete all of our ProRes LT media. And you can see all of our timeline minus some lower thirds uh, is offline. And now I'm gonna bring in uh, our camera master files. I'm gonna create a new bin for all this camera masters. And we're gonna open up where those live. And uh, you'll see right now, let me, before I do anything else, under our project settings, we have a setting, uh, I believe it's off by default, but we have it on here. These two settings are super valuable. They're under the general options. Uh, if you're doing any sort of dailies or online, I highly recommend turning these on. Assist using real names from is a super powerful tool that even if you're doing resolve dailies for other applications like Avid, you can control what the real name is for relinking. Uh, the source clip file name is sort of a no-brainer for your real name. Even if you're using DSLR clips, you'll now your dailies will have a real name that will relink to your source files. And then this option up here to automatically conform missing clips when they're added to the media pool is a cool trick that I'm going to demonstrate right now. I'm going to grab all of these camera master files. We're going to drag them in here. And what Resolve does under the hood is it adds the real name to each of the clips it looks for the corresponding real name in your timeline and relinks where it finds a match. If we weren't to have a match, it would show a little red icon in the corner. And that little red icon is because Resolve is trying to decide which media to link to. And that is precisely why I usually delete the dailies uh, in this process so nothing gets confused. Um, now, in a traditional online, like we were saying before, we have a reference that we're going to use as our uh, Bible for what this timeline looks like. And we already have that created. I'm just going to import it right now and link it to our timeline. So I'll make a new bin because I like to stay organized. We'll call this reference. Uh, for a reference file, there, there's two types of files that are unique, uh, mats and reference files. Uh, you can do some pretty interesting things with the mats come into play on the color page. They're black and white, uh, essentially cutouts, uh, but you can also have RGB mats to give you multiple layers of cutouts for color grading. Um, and then reference files uh, are, are files that you can link to the timeline that will play in tandem with your project. So we have a reference right here already created. Uh, to import these files, it's going to be a little different than a drag and drop. So if I were to drag and drop this file in into my bin here, it would come in as a regular file, and I could cut with it like a regular file. To use it as a reference clip, we're going to take this. I'm actually going to drag it into the source browser. And what that'll do is that'll just quickly navigate to the file in question. 
And then to import it as a reference clip, I'll right click and I'll set add as offline reference. Let's see if I can zoom in. Uh, add as offline reference clip. What you'll notice is the clip itself has a different icon. You can't actually edit with this clip. You can't put it in a timeline. It's only gonna be used to play in tandem with your timeline. So when we flip back over to the edit page and we look at our current bin with our current cut, I'm gonna right click, go to timeline and have this option that says link to offline reference clip. That offline reference clip is now linked and you can call it up in a couple different ways. On the preview monitor over here, you can use the little drop down to pull up the offline. And so you can, you can see it plays simultaneously. Uh, sometimes when you're scrubbing, you'll notice a slight delay. And so the easier way to use this when you're checking your file is, or you're checking your timeline, is to right click in your record monitor and use one of these wipes. These wipes are a very quick and handy tool when you're checking your offline to your online. Uh, traditionally, when you're sitting with a client, you're going to most likely use a box wipe, uh, which is what everyone likes to use when they're checking their file. But I think the most useful tool for, uh, for online is this difference mode option. And so if we turn into difference mode, our, time, our picture looks crazy, right? So what is happening is it's taking the offline image, it's overlaying it on top of our online, and it's using the difference blending mode. And where this comes in handy is where pixels are different, uh, you're gonna see it approach white. So all the colors you're seeing here are where the images differ. And in this case, uh, th you're actually looking at what the LUT's doing between the offline dailies and the uh, camera raw. And where this becomes handy when you're viewing this back is let me find a clip with some motion. Okay, cool, Patrick's talking. I'm gonna select this clip. I'm going to purposefully throw this out of sync. So I'm going to put it into trim mode and I'm going to use my bracket keys to throw it out of sync. See if I can do this while in a bigger view. Can I do this here? And you can see very quickly, so it's out of sync now, we have this white halo and that's super obvious that something is, has gone wrong. So what I can do is I can just park on it and I'll just start moving frame by frame until I find the point where it lines up. And we're looking for basically where, where all the white goes away. So if I go one direction, you can see the, the white halo. If I go back, it's there. This was in sync, and now it's approaching out of sync. Uh, it's sort of a weird tool where you train your eyes to use it, but when you're transferring from one application to another, it's very helpful to recreate a lot of effects that don't translate in Resolve, and this will get you there really quickly. So we should have everything up set up, and we should have everything online. Traditionally, for an online, we would, walk, we would watch this whole project yeah, back, we'll the and where there's any discrepancies, we would rebuild. Uh, but right now, in the interest of time, I'm gonna turn the, the mic over to our senior colorist, Dan Judy, uh, and Joseph Suzuki to talk about visual effects and color grading. Which one should I get on here? Oh, <laughs> Well, good evening. My name's Dan Judy. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Hey. All right. Well, one, I'm sitting here watching these guys. I'm not an editor. I'm going, holy crap, what are these guys doing? And I'm learning a lot sitting here watching, which is awesome. Um, <clears throat> now that they're done messing everything up, it's time for color. <laughs> uh, real quick, my career started uh, 30 years ago back in Florida. I was at a company called Century 3. We were on Universal Studios lot, and we were using Ediflex to do offline and uh, Moviola and, you know, the old spaghetti strands in the bin. A friend of mine was working on matinee, and I'd go up and watch him, and it's like just a cluster of film strips all over the place. Really cool. So back then, I worked on DaVinci, and prior to Rami's experience, I worked on the DaVinci Classic as did Rick Dalby, if he's still in here. And uh, the Da Vinci Classic had knobs, not trackballs. And I worked on the fourth box ever made. And I used to fly down with film to go down to uh, Post Edge in Fort Lauderdale and work with the guy that invented it. And <clears throat> they showed me a lot of things. I got educated early on. 
and uh, worked on you know, shows and started cutting my teeth as a colorist and then flew out here, moved out here, got on with modern video film for about 20 years and then ventured out on my own. I found Rami a couple years ago and I said, this guy's got his shit together. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's going in the right direction. He's going in the same direction I'm trying to go. I, I saw Resolve when it developed and it came out and I saw that it was going to take me away from a million dollar suite and put me in a twenty to fifty thousand dollar suite and I was going to be able to do better work than I've ever done in my life. And that took me to right here. And that brought me over to Rami. I've been there a little over a year now and it's very exciting and as, as you can see from his presentation and from these guys' presentation, great group of people, I feel very lucky to be involved. Um, color. This is where we get creative. You can do a variety of things in color. Joe is over right now. He's going to be working on the fusion page while I'm working on the color page. The one thing that, that we didn't illustrate right there, but I think you got to see pretty well while Jacob and Thomas were collaborating. Th Thomas was doing stuff over here while Jacob was quickly cutting some things together and moving bins around and everything else. While Thomas was onlining the show, once he got to a point where he had an actual file, I could have been over there color correcting already, which we do all the time. Um, the, the best part of collaboration, first of all, once you get started, your time to get the project done is always going to be the time that it takes to get the project done. You're still going to spend 10 hours in edit. You're still going to spend 16 to 24 hours in color. You're going to still spend a who knows how many hours in visual effects, and, uh, <laughs> and we don't let them out much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and but the, the the thing is, is instead of having to wait, you know, collaboration has always been a collaborative thing where we all collaborate, but we have to wait for each other. We aren't waiting so much anymore. We're now working concurrently. We're now working together on the same thing. So while I start doing color correction, and I've moved on and maybe I'm deep into the project, uh, they get a bunch of visual effects drop-ins. I get them, I can color correct them, they're sitting with their client in there and they go, well, I'll let Dan color correct them while we sit here. And what seems like mere seconds later, they go, hey, Dan's done, you want to see, him, see your shots with color on him? And they go, really? Wasn't that like five seconds ago? And in, in reality it was 15, 20 minutes, but it seemed like it went by like that because they're working and they're busy. And that's the beauty of collaboration. It's the beauty of being able to take edit, color, visual effects, deliverables. You know, you could send off and do a delivery from a particular point that you're sitting at. So the other thing that's important to understand about this entire process is this right here, this bad boy, is the master. We're no longer creating a mezzanine file, a tape, uh, third party shoveling it off to Avid or some, some other platform, Smoke or whatever, to make it happen. Once I'm done doing color and all the visual effects are dropped in and the titles are in and we get the audio tracks, it's ready to go. This bad boy right here, this one timeline, using to Rami's words from yesterday, one timeline, one master, is ready to go. And you can render it. And now what, it, what do they need? They need an H.264. You'd use this to generate it. You need a ProRes 4x4, you render it from this. You need a 4K file, you need a 6K file, what do you need? We can create it from this. And at this point, now I'm going to try and show you a little bit of color, because I think I rambled there for too long. Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> what I've got here, first of all, color correction, we use panels. So right now we're using the, uh, the uh, Blackmagic Mini panel. I work off the control surface, which are three separate panels, a little more elaborate, but this panel right here has a lot of power to it, and it shows you everything that you need to be able to do that you can do on the three panels. It's just condensed. And again, this right here, I don't like using. Mouse, bad phrase, bad thing to use. I, will, I like knobs, I like trackballs, I like buttons. I like to be able to get around and play around. So I'm gonna scoot over just a tiny bit. There we go. And what you've got is you have the availability to uh, jump shot by shot, literally jump up and down the timeline. If I had the control surface panels, I could send it by event number. So I could be on event 46 right here or 48. 
and send it down to event 500, which I can't do with this panel, unfortunately. But I can scroll if I have to. I could scroll down the timeline and, and get there and then go click. There we are. And if I wanted to go back to uh, the top of the show, I can hit the time code. And we're back at the top of the show. And there we are. So there's Patrick. There's Patrick again. Oh, <laughs> Joe's done some stuff here. I, if you look right up here. What is it? There we go. Where? All right, there it is. Here's a refresh icon. That indicates to me that Joe is doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's already done a, a visual effect over there. At the same time that he's doing that, go back out here, I can be color correcting. So I can go to this shot, and you have over here, you have a choice of power grades, you have a choice of stills, and you have a choice of, uh, let me go back here. You have a choice of middle mouse clicking on any thumbnail on this page, and you're going to be able to copy a color correction. So if I middle mouse click on that, or this, that one has a LUD on it. I'm going to shrink this down so we can see my node tree. And I'm going to scoot this over just a little bit. So I've built a pre-built pre node tree. And what I've got is I've got node 1 through 11. And I can, I can come in here, I can put a, a LUT in on node 1 or node 2. I leave node 1 available for myself. So if I do something out beyond node 1, I can go back into node 1 and do some tweaking on it without, without really messing up anything else. I can dial down some highlights, whatever. So I'm going to do a little color correction here. We're going to make Patrick look pretty good. Uh, let's, let me, uh, Let's go to this shot. That's a little better shot of it. So there's Patrick. I put a LUD on it, and I, if I wanted to, if I'm sitting with a client and the client goes, well, what did it look like in the RAW? I can disable the node. Enable the node, and that's with a button right here on the panel. Or you can come up here and disable, enable. You can also put the whole time, the whole node tree in bypass if you wanted to. And you can do that up here. There's bypass, and there's back. All right, so now I'm going to go to the next node. And let's, let's, put, uh, let's put a little bit bigger image up there so we can see what it looks like. Make Patrick nice and big for you all, all to see. Hmm. All right, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to do just a simple color balance. Oh, let's do this, too. I'm going to bring up the scopes. You have scopes and resolve. Did I hit them? There they are. I prefer using a parade. Let's go over here. Let's put this on to parade. And I'm going to put this one right here onto vector scope. I'm going to go into a dual display. And I don't like all the color on there if I can avoid it. So there we go. And if you want to expand your vector scope, if you hold down the option key in your middle mouse scroll, you can expand out your vector scope so you can see where your, your black lies, your white lies, little white lies. Anyway, um, so for Patrick here, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to give him a little bit of contrast. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to bring it down a little bit in the midtones, maybe drop down the blacks. And I'm purposely going to make him dark for, for a particular reason. I'm going to pop up the highlights a little bit, but I, I just wanted to bring up the highs to bring up his face a little bit, and I'm not going to worry too much about this area right here right now, because I'm going to go over here to, let's see, I've got a soft clip, of, uh, uh, they call it high soft, and I can roll it down, and it rolls off that highlight. So there's where it was before. If you see the scope up there, I'm going to roll it down. And all that's doing is really bringing down the top end of the picture so that it makes it look less electronic and more natural uh, for the client. So a lot of people don't like to see blown out highlights, so, but they also want it to be poppy. So you gotta, you got you to gotta meet all kinds of demands. Make it really saturated, but let's take a lot of color out. You know, stuff like that. 
Trust me, I get that request more often than you would think. Uh, I also get the questions like, oh, can you make it cool? And you go, so you start making it blue. And they go, you know, no, no, cool, you know, bitchin'. <laughs> and I go, okay, let me hit the bitchin' knob. So let's go after that. Uh, I've also been asked to dry people off, I, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So, so anyway, um, so now what I'm going to do is for uh, Patrick here, I'm going to go down. I, I kind of like what I've got going there. I'm going to go down here, and I've got a power window, which is here. In my node structure, I've created a parallel node. And that parallel node, if you look, let's go back here. And OK. It's right here. This, this indicates a parallel node. So what this node is referencing is whatever I, if I made this, this node here black and white, I could come into this node and retrieve color from this node and then blend them together to create whatever I create on the back end. In this particular case, I'm referencing this color correction here, and you can see that the connector runs off of this node and not the node directly above it. So what I'm going to do for Patrick right now is I'm going to try and make him you know, a tad bit more handsome. Um, I'm going to take the power window, and you can change the size of it. You can do it with your mouse, but again, like I said, I hate using the mouse, so I'm going to use my knobs. So there's, there's the size of it. I'm going to pan it across. This was uh, the reason why it's oval right now, I believe, is because of the aspect ratio of this particular shot, because otherwise it would be a normal circle right now. So if the aspect ratio were anamorphic, it would be much skinnier. And if it were you know, just straight spherical lens, it, it'll be a circle. All right, so I'm going <coughs> to refine him a little bit here. I'm going to tilt it up a tiny bit. I can soften it, rotate it, and now I'm going to turn around and I'm going to take the reticule off so we aren't seeing it. So I'll turn that bad boy off. Now I can see what I'm doing. So now I can go inside. Let's bring up Patrick a little bit. We can go in there. We could also make him look really sick. <laughs> hmm. Poor Patrick, bad sushi. Gas, <laughs> gas station sushi, man, stay away. All right, <clears throat> so now I've brightened him up, but I want the background, I want to separate him out a little bit more. So if I come right back here, if you see in the node tree, there's another node right here next to it. This is an outside correction of this power window. So this power window is a circle, and now I'm going to go over to this node, and I can now color correct outside of that circle, giving me a, a, a slightly different way of making Patrick stick out and we can go back a node and I can let's soften him just a tiny bit more and now if you want to see the before and after you can just go right up actually there's one on here but let's go back is it up here oh yeah it is there we go so there's what I was handed and again if we got a LUT from out in the field from a, uh, you know, a Rec 709, you know, Airy LUT to, to convert from Log C to Rec 709, and they put that on in dailies, whatever LUT they choose, even from the field. And I've gotten LUTs where, that are very specific that the DP is designed. And I'm always about trying to honor what they've, what they've done. A lot of times those LUTs in the field look really, really good until you get them into a controlled environment that we're in. And then when we see them, you go, wow, well, all the... All the detail is crushed. The highlights are not quite where they should be. It's really kind of out of balance. So I'll either start from that LUT and then go prior to the LUT on a, on a previous node and dial it back up and bring out some detail from it. And let's put this back here. So OK, sorry. So, so basically, this is what we've got now. I'm going to take the scopes off. Um, Joe has given me a shot. I'm going to give Joe a chance to look at it, but let's go back here and see what Joe has done while I've been sitting here yammering. All right. What is it? Node 9, event 9, I think. So if I hit refresh right here, all of a sudden, Joe's work 
shows up. Getting rid of this. And now I'm going to pass it off to Joe. So I will be really quick, because uh, we all love lives to live. Um, but the bottom line is the first thing I will tell you if you do want to dabble in Fusion uh, is you definitely want to have project backups enabled because it's not a perfect science yet and this will save your butt in a few situations. Um, but there are a lot of cool things. As you know, there's no exporting, there's no importing. As soon as you're done with a shot, you're done with a shot, uh, which is the awesome thing about it. And what I've done, I was gonna do this live, but we're a little short on time, is what I've done here is uh, I did a sign replacement. If we had something original, I used the uh, planar tracker to take a really simple uh, solid color, uh, get rid of it, and put a completely new logo onto the sign. And, um, and that's done very quickly. Again, there's no round tripping, which is really advantageous. And a cool thing that we've discovered is instead of having to do external mats, if say the colors need something, um, what I could do, since we've done a lot of work already doing tracking and getting everything accurate, is if I just take this, this is already a mat. And if I do a media out and I pipe this, uh, out here it's not going to show us anything different. But if I go into the color page, um, as it turns out, all you'd have to do is create uh, a source. Oh, look at that. Dan's, <laughs> Dan's already doing his thing. Um, and you could pipe that into anything and, and have that function as a mat. Um, so there are a lot of cool things on the horizon with Fusion, um, not just visual effects. We're doing all of the titling for NCIS Los Angeles completely inside of Resolve because of that. And there's a lot of scripting capabilities. So it's very exciting. It's a little rocky road, but uh, the advantages are, are pretty cool. And I think it's, it's worth looking into if you haven't already. All right, lights up, please. Please thank the team from Digital Film Tree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're running a little bit late, but everybody take your raffle tickets out right now.